Hi everyone and welcome to Bridging the Gap. I'm your host, Kelly Lavelle, and this week I'm joined by Maya braham -Bakar. Maya is a passionate young scientist and one of the young change leaders that is featured in her upcoming book, The Power of Youth. I'm really excited to have her join us today to share a little bit about her story and particularly uh, about her current scientific endeavors. Uh, Maya, could you perhaps take a moment to share with our audience a little bit about yourself and what you're passionate about? Hi, I'm Maya Verhan Burkhart. I'm 17 years old and my I am an aspiring young scientist and I hope to inspire the next generation of female scientists and climate change activists. Well, thank you again for, for joining us. Could you perhaps walk us through a little bit of how you found your passion in science? Because uh, you've had quite the journey and, uh, and quite the accomplishments already for, for your young age in the field. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've always been um, a very curious and inquisitive child and just ever since I was ever since I was really young I would just constantly ask my parents questions um, I feel kind of bad for them actually uh, I would ask them questions like how does the toaster work and why is the sky blue and why do beavers build dams all sorts of questions about anything and my parents would always do their very best to answer those questions um, but eventually I started to ask questions that no one really had answers to and I was really curious to know what the answers were. Uh, and so I turned to the scientific method to answer some of those questions for myself. And originally I was doing a lot of work in biology and, and biotechnology. And so I, I did projects ranging from trying to develop a prototype for an intelligent antibiotic to doing some work on two potential Alzheimer's drugs and then discovering some completely unrelated new properties of them. Um, and so in order to do that, I had tried to email a bunch of university professors um, in my in my area. And unfortunately, I got very few replies seeing as I was, I think, 10 years old at the time. And and uh, so I was discouraged, but not enough to stop me. And so I decided that I was going to build my own microbiology laboratory in my basement or my parents' basement and do experiments there for myself. And so I went out and did that. And I can't say it was the best of laboratories, but it certainly, it certainly did the job. And I ended up doing those first two research projects over, I think, a three or four year period. And I think that was really what got me started and got me interested in the sciences and after that I've worked in a wide variety of fields. I've been really fortunate to have opportunities to participate in um, projects and programs in, in quantum cryptography, um, tracking near-Earth asteroids for the Harvard-Smithsonian, um, and most recently doing some work at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics uh, over the summer. So I guess I've just had to, I, I think it was the curiosity that that really drove me to the sciences in the first place. And then it's incredible applicability to the real world and being able to help real people with the work that I do. And I think it's that combination of those two things that, that make it so exciting for me. I love your story because um, often when we are aspiring, especially in the science field, like you had mentioned, uh, we kind of turn to seeing if we can shadow, we um, always kind of recommend to see if we can shadow under a professor or a university. But when you're young, particularly as young as 10, that can be very difficult to do. Uh, and so I love learning how you created a laboratory in your basement and just continue to do it on your own. <laughs> um, with that in mind, though, um, how did you overcome some of those hurdles of not really having, uh, let's say, the, the mentorship or expertise in the field when you first started out? I, I, I can't say I really overcame the hurdles, or at least not at first. I think I kind of ran into the hurdles, knocked them over, and then kind of inadvertently walked over top of them. Um, <laughs> so so uh, as an example, with that first research project that I was talking about when I was 10 years old and I was trying to develop that antibiotic, I, I made a lot of mistakes. That was my first research project, and it took a total of three years for me to do anything useful because the first two years I screwed up. Um, and so as an example, uh, the, in the very first iteration of my basement laboratory, uh, I, I didn't have access to any sort of proper equipment. 
So what I did was I took a pop can cooler and stuck an electric heating blanket inside of it and used that as my makeshift incubator. And I think the temperature varied by like plus or minus two degrees or something ridiculous like that. It was totally not scientific or proper in any way, but that's what I was using. Um, and I took, I, I, to, as my bacterial source, I didn't have a proper any sort of proper culture. So I took a piece of raw chicken that my parents were going to be cooking for dinner later that night and left it out on the deck for a few days to allow it to accumulate some bacteria. Uh, and I used that as my bacterial source. Again, totally unscientific, actually pretty dangerous. Um, but that's what I started out with doing. And so what I did was I, I took this, this piece of raw chicken, um, I, I got my agar, I put that inside the petri dish, and then I used the piece of raw chicken to um, swab the petri dish. And then I put, I sort of, I was testing the antibacterial efficacy of a few uh, select herbs and so I kind of dumped the herbs on top of the uh, on top of the petri dish and stuck all of that inside of my pop can cooler uh, and and stuck it there for a couple of days and opened it up later to find that there was no bacteria there so of course the the herbs must actually have antibacterial properties which was what I was trying to figure out in the first place. And so I took this research project to the local science fair that I had read about in my newspaper uh, with the hopes of sharing my new discovery with the world. And I was giving my science fair presentation and, and my judge was smiling and nodding at me. And it was only at the end of my presentation, he goes, Maya, you realize you, you didn't, um, it, was, it wasn't the herbs that killed the bacteria you killed the bacteria by suffocating them. They died because of lack of oxygen. <laughs> uh, so that wasn't the most fortuitous of starts, uh, I'll say. And then the next year I messed something else up and it was only after those two failures that finally in that third year, um, I, I did everything right and, and finally made a sort of meaningful contribution. Um, but it was that process of, of slowly refining what I was doing, and there was just a lot of reading online and in textbooks and consulting scholarly papers and, and things like that to, to gain more information about what I should be doing, because I didn't really have access to, as you said, traditional professor mentors. I hope that's all right. The, the whole time I'm just thinking too of what your parents are thinking as you're cooking raw chicken in your basement. <laughs> um, with the, the looking back, um, if you were to um, give advice to um, other ten-year-olds or aspiring scientists who um, may be in a similar situation to how you started out, um, what would you say to them? Uh, never, never stop asking questions, I think, is, is the big thing. Um, as long as your curiosity is what's driving you, you'll find a way to make, to make it work. Um, and maybe sometimes there will be some failures, but that doesn't matter, because as long as you keep persevering and um, you keep looking for people who are, who are, who are going to help you and, and lift you up, um, keep asking questions and always stay curious and follow wherever your curiosity will take you. This series is focused on looking at um, young people around the world today um, with a new light and really trying to see um, beyond the labels that society kind of knows us for, like the millennials and digital natives and all these things, and looking at us as a what I like to call a change generation. Um, looking at your peers and in, in the change generation. What do you? What does that mean to you? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think that um, so many of the peer, so many of the people that I've, I've encountered uh, as a result of doing science fair competitions and attending student science conferences and even doing work in totally unrelated fields. I was a student trustee for a little while. Um, I was on the minister's education minister's student advisory council for a bit as well. I've had the opportunity to meet so many people my age who are just doing absolutely incredible things for the world. And, and I, I certainly, I think that, 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 or at least as far as I'm aware, I think that a lot of people think that, that my, our generation is, is, um, 
is is sort of lazy and always on our phones and that kind of thing. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I have a lot of technology troubles. So I can certainly say that that's not true. And we're definitely not lazy. The The work that I see other people my age doing is, is just amazing. And so it fills me with a lot of hope for the future. And uh, um, yeah, so I, I, that's what I think that we're, we're, we're uh, a very motivated bunch. And looking at um, the opportunities right now for um, uh, young, young leaders and scientists and inventors and innovators, um, if there was one action that industry or um, like businesses or government could take um, to create better opportunities for your peers, what do you think that would be? Um, well, so, so one of the, one of the other things that I mentioned at the very beginning of the interview that I'm extremely passionate about is finding ways, uh, to combat climate change. I, I really think that, that, that this is one of the biggest problems or, or the biggest problem that, that our generation is going to be facing. And if we don't take action soon, the consequences could be quite significant. Um, and, and so I think that if there's one thing that that all of those groups that you mentioned should be doing is trying to be more cognizant of their actions and the impact of their actions on our planet um i think that that a lot of corporations are are too focused on the bottom line but the bottom line isn't going to matter um if we don't take action soon um, and so i think that that's one of the most important things that they can be doing Wonderful. And as a final um, kind of piece of advice or, or, um, or thought, um, looking on your journey thus far, um, is there, do you have one, what is kind of the best advice that you've received from someone else or that has helped shape you on that journey? I think the best advice I've been given recently um, is is someone I was talking to to a friend of mine and she said remember it's always about people and I think that that for me recently I've been working in robotics and and theoretical physics and and fields where it's very easy to get bogged down in in code or in math um, and and I think that that at the end of the day the one thing that keeps me going is knowing or thinking about the people who will be positively impacted by the work that I'm doing. Um, and so I think it's really important to just always keep in mind that we are all people and we're here to help each other. Um, and so I really think that that should be everyone's focus as they're going through life um trying to help as many people as possible even if it's just one person a relative a friend or if it's the entire world um every single bit of change makes a difference i love that i think you're right too we can get so caught up in um all of the even just life let alone all the technology within it uh, that you can kind of forget um kind of what that that end goal or the beneficiary of what we're trying to do is. Um, with that in mind, because you have been involved in so many things um, from physics and biology and now you said robotics and things like that, um, I guess one last question I would have for you would be um, kind of what excites you most right now about, about the scientific field or um, a specific area of work you're doing? Yeah, I think that, that now is a really good time to be a scientist or an engineer because there are so many fields that are just right at the tipping point of, of having a really large breakthrough. And I, I'm certainly not qualified to, to, to give the list of potential fields that will have an impact. Um, but I mean, a lot of the ones that I have been working in, I mean, quantum is just so exciting from so many aspects, quantum cryptography, quantum computing. Um, uh, low temp or high temperature superconductors are uh, is a field that that I think is going to be really important and and has holds a lot of potential. Um, even the work that I'm I, I'm going to be participating in later on in the year um, in cosmology. There's just so much exciting stuff happening. And then on the engineering side of things, robotics and machine learning and AI, they're all um, starting to to gain or they have been gaining for the last few years a lot of popularity. Um, and, and I think we're only just starting to see some of the potential applications that they could have to society. So I think that 
there are quite a few fields that are poised to have a dramatic impact on our lives. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate you taking the time and I'm looking forward to seeing which of those fields you end up creating your impact in because you're certainly um, trailblazing a path for young leaders and, and young female scientists um, already. For those of you listening, it's your turn. What do you think? Add your thoughts to the discussion using the hashtag Bridging the Gap. And give this podcast a thumbs up if you like some of the comments and advice that has been shared today.